uh, Max Hauser. I'm a partner and managing director in uh, uh, BCG, Moscow. I'm heading our technology practice. I'm very excited to see such a broad uh, panel. Um, I think it's fair to say that I have a panel around me which constitutes mostly enthusiasts or believers in the blockchain uh, uh, technology. As such, I see my role today as someone who sets a bit of a counterpoint, a bit of a critical focus uh, on the topic. So I start by uh, briefly introducing the panelists. Uh, from the end, uh, we have uh, Alexander uh, Baradic, who is the founder of the Universa blockchain uh, platform and many other startups in the field. We have uh, Olga Nikolaevna Skarbakova, uh, first deputy governor of the Central Bank. We have next to me uh, Sergei uh, Zhigayev, um, and now I need to read because it's getting a bit longer, chairman of the State Duma Committee on Economic Policy, Industry, Innovative Development and Entrepreneurship. Um, we have um, Bob uh, to my left. Bob is uh, the global uh, leader in Deloitte for Financial Services. Um, we have uh, Shannon uh, Paulin from uh, Intel with us. He's responsible for the implementing of new technologies in global markets. Uh, we have Vladislav Martinov from the Ethereum Foundation, uh, supervisory board member until recently, and now uh, in charge of the talent uh, foundation of Ethereum. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Demetrios uh, Zamboglo, who is working for Like as the uh, business development uh, officer. In the uh, first role, we have uh, two speakers, Alexander Polyakov, um, who is a, a director uh, in the uh, Research and Design Institute of the uh, Urban Transport of Moscow. And finally, we have uh, Yuri Pripachkin, um, who is uh, heading the blockchain Association uh, and Cryptocurrency Association of Russia. Um, the title of our session today is uh, uh, the brief history of uh, the blockchain technology. So we'll look a bit back in the past, we'll talk about uh, the current, but then we will focus our discussion on the future and the potential of this uh, technology. Um, if I believe uh, uh, the statistics that your colleagues uh, have published, 74% uh, of large corporates say um, that uh, there's a compelling business case to the blockchain technology. If you look around us, um, blockchain has so far mainly found application or public application uh, within uh, cryptocurrencies. So I would like to spend today's discussion mostly on looking outside of cryptocurrencies so where do we find future applications of blockchain technology? And this is how I would like to start the discussion round. Maybe, Alexander, I start with you, and then I ask every of the participants to just, uh, for 30 seconds, uh, to comment where do you see, at this moment, looking into the eight or 10 years history of the blockchain technology, um, the main achievement, the main success um, of blockchain technology outside of cryptocurrencies, because this one everybody knows. I would like to focus more on what's going on um, beyond that. So to answer the, the, the first part of the question, uh, the reason that we, we have a blockchain is because we are dealing with uh, contracts, transactions, and uh, records. And the major reason that uh, we actually try to to, in a way, self-regulate self the blockchain is that we, we, we digitized it. Um, in 2008, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto or a, or a group of people have created this, uh, this paper, solving one of the most interesting computer science problem, uh, the double spending problem. And uh, this innovation have uh, opened this uh, blockchain revolution in, uh, in, very, in, very, in many areas. For example, trade, finance, healthcare, e-commerce. So in summary, what is uh, a blockchain? A blockchain is actually a FITS model. Uh, and uh, a FITS model, it's a model that actually can tackle fraud, 
where uh, fraud is associated with transactions. Uh, we can deal with intermediation. For example, this intermediation, if intermediates are not necessary to be in uh, this position to start with, and through outputs, uh, transactions per second, increase the processing power, and last but not least, uh, stable data. So we will not have any volatile data. So we can apply this kind of blockchain systems anywhere where this uh, FITS model actually fits. Where the FITS model fits. Um, so uh, uh, while you already uh, started, um, Demetrius, maybe we continue with the second question because I mean we talked a bit about the past and it's, I mean, you already gave very good indications for what we should discuss later to make this technology a success. I wanted to talk quickly about the present. Um, because if you, I mean, if you look until 12 months ago, I would say there was a, a very big hype uh, around this technology. Everything was rosy, everything was growing. Um, if you look at the news over the last six to 12 months, the headlines are changing a bit. Uh, cryptocurrencies have fallen. Half of the ICOs of the last 12 months are out of business already. Um, some countries have introduced uh, regulation which is not very favorable. You operate a uh, crypto exchange um, and you are probably the closest to actually understand the pulse of the market. How do you see the situation at the moment? Is the hype over or is it just consolidation or is the hype actually going stronger? Uh, so to, to answer your question, Max, is are we in, is, is it again uh, a tulip mania? But are we in a digital tulip mania? Are we experiencing what happened in 1637 when the tulips have grown up by 200 times? Stephen Hawking in 2010 has said it uh, the best. Mankind is in danger of, its, uh, of destroying itself, mainly based on greedy, greediness and stupidity. So let's take Bitcoin. Yesterday, Bitcoin has traded a volume of around 6 billion, where in January it was trading four times that. Uh, we had a peak of Bitcoin of around $21,000, where now Bitcoin is trading around $7,500. We had intraday ranges of $4,000, and uh, we have Bitcoin still accounting for 40% of the market, where the remaining uh, tokens, excluding the top 10 cryptocurrencies, are still 25% of the market. Uh, the second part of your question is about uh, fraudulent ICOs. Can we avoid fraud? The answer to this question is probably no, but can we mitigate the risk? Then the answer is yes. So how do we mitigate this kind of risk? Uh, first of all, people should understand in the audience when you invest in an ICO, you might lose all your money, which is not uh, something really nice. So how do we limit ourselves uh, in order to avoid this uh, fraudulent type of activities? Uh, one way is by introducing regulation and bringing licenses in such kind of operations. The other way, I would say, is using third parties such as big auditors to audit this kind of processes. And uh, the third way, I believe, is similar to any startup or any entrepreneurship project, is to first review the team, the white paper, which is the business plan, and the MVP of the team to see if they have a minimum viable product, so if they have a demo and they know what they actually need to build. Uh, increasing regulation, the third part of the question. So when, when do regulators start playing an active part? So when a lot of people are actually sending emails or letters or communicating with the regulators saying that they have been defrauded and in many cases on ICOs, then the regulators should ask, uh, act 
and start a formal investigation. And then after this formal investigation, actions should be done. Nowadays, the SEC is piloting uh, an ICO scam. So in order to see if people are actually willing to invest in these high-risk products without the risk of actually losing their money. So the social media channels have helped this kind of operations. They have raised a lot of, uh, of money for this kind of activities. But to give them the benefit of a doubt, uh, these kind of operations were not regulated. So I have a question for the audience, actually, if you don't mind, Max. Uh, I would like to ask the audience if you would have invested in an ICO if uh, the message was clear and it will say that you might lose all of your money if you have invested in this ICO. How many of you will have invested in this ICO? So. But I'm the only venture investor here. <laughs> it's nothing new. In venture capital, you also will lose, you may lose everything. Exactly. And how many of you guys will actually involve the regulator if you actually have lost all the money? In venture capital, 80% of all your investments fell. Also. Yes. yes, but if it was a fraudulent investment, how many of you guys will actually... It, it depends on the definition of, of the fraud. In venture investment, 80% of the projects that you invest in uh, are losing, are failing. Maybe not because of the fraud, uh, but maybe because uh, the team was not able to achieve the targets. To us as investors, there's no difference. We lose money either way. Uh, so it's just a, a new way of uh, uh, mobilizing money. And fraud probably is not the only reason and the main reason for that. Correctly is, well, uh, and, and actually, you're, I, I would assume you're actually saying similar things, is to say, so well, my you are, let me finish, please. Of Russia. Let me just finish, please. The, um, <laughs> If you, if you take a risky investment and you are aware of taking a risky investment, well, then you will probably not end up complaining that this risky investment was not regulated. I think we are all aligned on that.